Good morning. Happy Saturday. So happy to see all of these familiar faces on here this morning. Um, we are so excited to dig into our next topic. This is a brand new webinar um, for Dallas Habitat, a brand new topic actually for the first time in a while. So we're really excited to bring this information to you guys this morning. Um, if you don't know me already, my name is Blaine Cower. Uh, I am the Senior Director of Homeowner Services for Dallas Area Habitat for Community. And we are so excited to have you here today. If you are a Dallas Habitat client, if you're tuning in from Facebook Live, um, if this is your first webinar, congrats. We're happy to have you. You know, these webinars for Dallas Habitat have been about bringing important, relevant content to you guys to your fingertips, you know, in a very easy way um, where you really could be just hanging out on your couch this morning, hopefully drinking a cup of, uh, of coffee or um, maybe eating breakfast. And so that's the cool part about this series is that it's so accessible. So thanks for taking just an hour of your time to tune in this morning. We know we've got some really important content that we're going to dig into today as we talk about preventing identity theft. You know, this subject for us was really important because in the age where we do so much of what we do as a society online, digitally, when you talk about just managing your personal business, right, we're doing everything online these days, including in the Dallas Habitat program. And when you do that, you know, there's certain precautions that we need to have in mind to make sure that safety is our top priority um, and security and your information is valuable. We're going to talk about that today. Um, so we have brought on today one of our partners and experts on this subject, um, Comerica Bank. Comerica is a longtime partner of Dallas Habitat. We're really excited to bring back our, our partners from Comerica. If you were working with us back in January, you might remember our facilitator who's going to join us this morning from a class that she did at our office. Um, back in January. So we're happy to have her back. Uh, I'd like to welcome on Luisa Perez. Luisa, good morning. We are so excited to have you. And looks like she's coming on right now. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Well, before we get started, just a quick um, run through of some housekeeping rules for all of our participants. If you don't know already, just a reminder that today's class is being recorded. And the beauty of that is that you'll be able to access this class beyond today, beyond this morning. So, you know, down the road, if you think, geez, you know, I know Louisa told me about what I need to do about this part of preventing the identity theft and I can't remember, you can always go back and rewatch it. Um, all of our webinars, including today's webinar, are being um, archived on our website and they are also archived on our YouTube channel. Okay, and these are open to anyone anywhere. And so, you know, just think about that. If you're new today, if this is your first webinar, remember that you can go back and watch any of the webinars that we've been doing since April, um, since COVID began. We've got a ton on there. I think this is our eighth or ninth webinar that we've done so far. So keep that in mind. Also, um, in terms of communicating with us, we wanna hear from you today. We want this to be interactive and engaging. You can definitely utilize the chat box. I see so many of you guys already doing that and sending in sweet comments. Good morning to everyone. Um, you can definitely send us stuff in the chat. We also have a Q&A feature that you'll see um, a toggle for either on your phone or your computer. And you can send us questions that way as well. If you send us questions in the Q&A um, behind the scenes, we're going to mark some to end, um, I'm sorry, to answer live at the end. If you are, um, you know, a regular on our webinar series, you know that at the end, we always do a live Q&A session. So we'll hold some of the big questions for the end. Um, but as we have questions for Luisa to dig into a little bit more, um, we can make this informal as well and get those answered in, in real time. So we want to hear from you guys. Make sure you send in any and all questions you have for Louisa. With that being said, Louisa, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Blaine. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Blaine, and everybody for inviting me on to do this presentation today. It's one of my favorite part of my job, just to be able to educate anybody and everybody, whether you're a Comerica customer or not. Um, that's been my goal since I've started in banking, and it's a pleasure to actually be able to do that now. 
So my name is Luisa Perez. I work for Comerica Bank. I've been in banking for 13 years. The last eight of those years I've been here with Comerica Bank. I started as a teller. I'm now a personal banker, but those are just titles to me. That's not actually what I do or what I stand for. You know, I love to, I commit to being a one-stop shop for all my customers, for questions, concerns, solutions, anything and everything. I love educating my clients on everyday products. You know, a lot of people think that a checking account is just, oh, just a place I keep my money. But it's so much more than that. And I love being able to explain that to my customers. So moving forward, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here to start the presentation. Blaine, can you confirm that you're able to see that for me? Yes, ma'am. I can. Awesome. Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started here. As Blaine mentioned, this presentation will be about our, sorry, having a bit of a technical difficulty here. Give me one second. There we go. Okay. It's about how to protect what identity theft is and how you can protect yourself from it. So how often does this happen? Believe it or not, it happens every two seconds. So in the time that we've been here, probably hundreds of thousands of people have had their information stolen or bought in some way, shape or form. Identity theft, identity fraud is not something new. I'm like, it, it's been happening since before any of us even knew what it was, before we were even born. Um, and now that everything is now digital, we do everything online, technology, it's just a brand new way that fraudsters have been able to, to get your personal information. So we'll just start with the basics. You know, we're gonna talk about how you can prevent your information from being stolen. You know, this is not going away as much as we try and prevent, 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 you know, these fraudsters, you know, they're always gonna try and find a new way. So most fraud, especially financial fraud, begins with fraudsters getting a hold of your personal identifying information, or you'll hear me refer to it as PII. Once your personal information falls into the wrong hands, a fraudster can start to impersonate you. They can acquire goods, services, and even get credit in your name without you even knowing. So Comerica wants you to be aware of common ways that fraudsters are stealing your identity, what to prevent, and what to do if you do become a victim of identity theft. So I'm gonna briefly toggle over to this flyer here, which I will blame send out to you so that you're able to give it out to anybody who's asking for it. And um, I will provide my email address as well if anybody wants to reach out and would like for me to send this out to them. So this is what I was talking about, the personal identifying information, PII. It's anywhere from your full name, your social, your identification, date of birth, home address, credit cards, debit cards, bank account, secret information, you know, mother's maiden name, pin words, pa pins, passwords, all that kind of stuff. Anything that you use to get into your accounts. So we'll go back over here. So there should have been a poll question. I don't know if we got that, yep. but yep. we're going to go ahead and that poll if you're ready, Luisa. Yeah, go ahead. All right, guys. Our first poll question is how much do you think? Your PII, your personal identifying information, is worth in real dollars. So go ahead and, and vote real quick in this poll. We want to hear from y'all. What do you think? We know it's worth something. All right, we see we're about halfway. Half of our participants have voted. Okay, these are interesting results coming in. We want to hear from y'all. Let's see. That's almost everyone. Oh, 
Okay. We are going to end the poll and let's share these results real quick. Great. So a lot of you guys think that your information is worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Personally, yeah, I would think if somebody's going to try and steal my information, they're going to have to spend money for it. It's valuable to me. It's priceless. I've worked so hard to build my credit and establish my name and get everything where I want to be. So let's see, what are these fraudsters actually paying for our information? Surprisingly, they only spend, they, most of us probably spend more on a tank of gas than what they spend on purchasing your personal information, your PII. This is just an average. So to although to us, you know, our information is priceless. It's worth a lot more than that. This is what they're actually purchasing your information for. They're called fools. It's a single package that can have any and all of this information. All your PII, name, address, social, date of birth, background information, you know, your financial background information, all that for just less than what most of us would buy again for a tank of gas. It's crazy, right? All right, so what the best offense is a good defense, right? I know that's not the first time most of us have heard that. So when it comes to uh, fighting fraud, that's, that's your best offense is a good defense. So it's, it's about monitoring your stuff before it happens so that when you see or you get alerts or something, you'll know, okay, wait, this isn't right, instead of figuring it out after the fact. So like I mentioned earlier, fraudsters are changing their tactics all the time. You know, years ago, we didn't have online banking, mobile banking, where you could just open the app and there you go, you can check your balance, you can see your transaction histories. If you forgot your account number, you can pull up your account number. Fraudsters know that. A lot of the times they know this stuff before we do. That's why we've gathered some information and you know we're gonna raise your awareness today and I'm gonna do my best to show you how to best protect yourself. You know, the bottom line is the more you know about fraud scams, the better you become at protecting yourself from becoming a victim. So let's talk about it. What is identity theft? Where does it happen? What can they do with your information? You know, what tips can, you know, I'm gonna provide you provide you chips, tips on how to protect yourself. So identity theft is a type of fraud. It's committed and attempted using your PII of a, obviously of an, another person using your information without your authority. They establish credit, credit, some people open accounts at banks. That's actually kind of a big one right now with people being able to open accounts online. You know, they're able to open accounts in your name, using your information, overdrawing them, you know, writing bad checks, and then it's affecting you. And they just got probably went on a shopping spree and got a whole new wardrobe. So identity theft can happen online, not through the internet. That's, you know, easy. that right there. Internet is huge right now. You know, if you do everything online and somebody gets access to your computer, that's, it's like game over almost. It can be through the phone. To be honest, I get this a lot with my elderly customers. You know, people call and they say, oh, I'm your grandson, I'm your granddaughter, I need help. You know, um, to be honest, I've experienced this a lot with my Hispanic customers as well, because, you know, they may have family that lives out of the country and this is a big form of communication. You know, they'll know personal information and they'll try and talk to you and make you feel sorry for them. Like, oh my God, you're my long lost cousin. I knew you and what do you need? I'll help you. Believe it or not, your home. People, not just breaking into your home. You know, it kind of goes back to this. I've had people who do old fashioned um, mailing their payments in, right? And you know, you can leave a letter for your mailman for them to pick it up so you don't have to go to the post office. I actually had this happen to a client. She was mailing her payments and they broke into her mailbox, got her checks that she was sending payments and they um, altered the checks 
to instead of paying, I think it was like City of Dollars or something like that, somehow that managed to change that into a name. And I'm like, her water bill didn't get paid and she didn't know until they were almost going to cut off her, her, her payment, you know, so old school or new school, your stuff isn't safe. You know, maybe had she used the internet to keep track of her bill to make sure it got paid, she'd be able to see, oh, what's going on? I mailed this payment, it didn't happen. You know, maybe she could have caught it. But then again, they could have used the internet to get her stuff. Email, oh, this is huge. I know this was especially huge when it first started. You know, phishing schemes, malware, viruses, people send you an email from something you don't know, or, oh my God, there's this big promotion going on. You know, don't you don't want to miss out. Take advantage, you know, we want those Bath and Body Work coupons, right? But we need to make sure that it's coming from the company that's sending this from. So we want to be extra cautious. I'm not saying you don't use any of these things. It's about using all of these different ways to access your information but knowing how to protect yourself from being taken advantage of. Other ways that aren't on here, and I'm sure this is something everybody's heard of, are the skimming devices that they put on the uh, debit card machines at the store. It's really big at gas stations, you know, maybe like those ATMs that you do at the convenience stores, you know, banks themselves have ways to prevent. I know like what we do opening procedures one of the things that banks have to do or bank employees have to do is they have to check their atm daily to ensure that those gaming devices are not on their machines but not everybody does that not all convenience stores do that not all restaurants do that you know with restaurants you've heard of employees stealing um copies of customer account numbers and using cards that way you know unfortunately no matter where you go, you're, you can't guarantee that your information is going to be safe. So, you know, the more personal information or PII a foster gets about you, the more your identity is at risk. So next is we're going to talk about credit card and debit card fraud. So if you authorize transactions on your debit card, for example, that doesn't necessarily mean if there's unauthorized transactions, I'm sure if, if I was in front of you guys and I asked that question, how many of you had an, a fraud attempt or had an unauthorized transaction on your debit card? Probably more than half the class would raise their hand. I'm like, I even had it, right? So, but just because somebody had got access to your debit card, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a victim of identity theft. That's just a different form of fraud. They could just have your debit card and your PII information is still safe. So the most two, the two most common forms for the debit card and credit card fraud are the skimming devices and data compromise or card compromise. So I know a lot of people, I've met people who they're like, I have no idea how these people got my information. You know, I don't, I rarely use the card itself or I ha the card is with me. How do they use the card in Arizona? Or, well, the thing is when you use your card at another place, whether you use it physically or even online, if that store or that website is compromised in any way, fraudsters can get access to your information. Just like when, um, who was it? I want to say it was Equifax who was breached. Equifax or Experian, I always get the two confused. I believe it was Equifax though. They were breached and see how much information. I'm like, credit bureaus have everything on us and they were breached. So it's crazy if they can get into, you know, a credit bureau, what's to stop them from getting into, you know, Bath and Body Works. I'm sorry, I love Bath and Body Works. So I'm probably going to use that a lot in my examples. Not just stealing your card. Skimming devices are allow them to be for you to still have your card and them to be able to get all everything they need to access your bank account. Right here again, card not present. Your card doesn't have to be present. Like I said, how many of us shop online? You know, if somebody gets your card and to be, I'm like, we 
don't give me, I don't, we hope that our families are, you know, that they won't do that to us or know they're good people. But sometimes, you know, families have that black sheep, right? You know, or maybe your kid thinks they really deserve this game and they'll go into mom or dad's wallet, put out, pull out the card and um, buy that Call of Duty game, the new Call of Duty game, right? You know, the card doesn't always have to be present. Purchases can be made online, telephone, mail, data compromise. So that would be, that's what I was talking about earlier. The merchant themselves get robbed or their machine wasn't secure or they got um, compromised in some other way. That's another way for your card to be compromised. That's why what was it, I want to say two, three years ago, 2017, I want to say, was everybody has that card now, right? Where you have the chip on your card. Well, this, that chip was a solution to help prevent card compromises. It's called the EMV chip or a Euro MasterCard Visa. That's what the EMV stands for. So what the chip does is that instead of, and a lot of stores will tell you, no, you don't swipe it anymore, you insert the chip. So what the chip does is it creates a unique data element with every single transaction. So that means each single transaction has a unique data, I guess like a code that they use for that transaction and it cannot be repeated. So this allows for a more secure form of authentication and helps prevent counterfeit card fraud. So like before with just the stripe, if you swipe it and some cards still only have the stripe, they don't have the EMV, but most do now, you know, if you swipe the card, that's where the skimming devices come to play is when you swipe it, it reads all the information it needs from your card, the card number, the, um, the three digit security code on the back, the, your expiration date, and when you put in that PIN number, they're able to capture that PIN number at the same time. With the EMV chip, this prevents that. So always, I would always be kind of, I wouldn't say never swipe your card, but, you know, check the machine. If you go to the store, feel free to kind of like, you know, make sure there's nothing that's just popping up, nothing. I do it all the time. I don't let the cashier look at you like you're crazy. I'm like, I'm going to make sure my information is protected so just and it's these things are pretty easy to spot because normally if you just you know lift something up it just pops right out so like i said everybody switched to the emv so for consumers you know when you get your card activate your new card you know, learn your payment processes, how you can use the card, if there's other ways you can use it. And I'll probably, I'll bring it up later on, but there's even banks now that will allow you to create for like when you shop online, they'll allow you to create what's called a virtual card number. So it's a one-time use. You don't actually have to use your actual card number. They'll give you kind of like a phantom number that will allow the transaction to go through, but it's only that one time. And if that merchant get compromised, your car does not compromise. So learn that about your, go to your banks. Hey, do you guys offer this? What do you offer? You know, do you do the EMV card? If you don't do the EMV chip, you know, when is, when are you going to start requiring that? Ask those questions. You have a right as a consumer to ask those questions and how they're going to protect your information. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about what can people do if they do get your information, what can they do with it? Surprisingly oh, enough. Oh, wait, I forgot the poll. <laughs> Let's go back. <laughs> Ignore the other slide. <laughs> I'm sorry, when I get going, I was like, oh. Okay, got, we have a poll question. It. Hey, before, and part of why I wanted to stop you, we, we're going to run your poll real quick, but also, yeah. you know, I think it's probably worth mentioning too, listening to you explain about this was making me personally think about, you know, in the age of COVID-19, how many of us aren't even like, I'm definitely not swiping anywhere. Usually <laughs> to Louisa's point, I'm inserting a chip somewhere, but honestly, right now with COVID-19, I'm usually paying with Apple Pay 
or something that's like 100% contactless, which I think begs another question, right? And, you know, from the research I've done, and would love to hear your professional insight, Luisa, from what I understand, a lot of these contactless methods of paying, including Apple Pay, are even, you know, to some extent, slightly more secure, even than um, inserting your, your chip, because it requires that the fraudster would have to have um, your identifying information for your device, meaning either face ID or your fingerprint, right? right? And most of us use anything, right? Exactly. So anything else you have to, to shed light on that? I just wanted to kind of open that up to you. Uh, no, that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I, I can't believe I didn't even think about it because I use those uh, forms of payment as well. Actually, this morning I went to Starbucks and I used the app. So what I do is, and I'm sure everybody does this with, you know, I don't know, Chick-fil-A or people, other uh, businesses that have an app where they allow you to load money onto like their card, right? And you just, I just showed the phone, they flashed it. And they, let's say a fraudster did try, they, there's nothing for them to get. I put it essentially on a gift card that can only be used with that business. So I'm safe. My card information didn't get compromised. I'm good to go. And it only loads up whenever I choose to load it. So that's right. another way. That's definitely true. Yeah, so safe, you know, in two ways, right? Safe for my WD prevention and also obviously with the current pandemic going on. Right. Um, so I think, you know, it's an interesting time right now as what's going on from a health perspective even continues to evolve the way that we manage our personal business, like banking. Really interesting. Like I said, just because, you know, technology is a new way consumers, or not consumers, but fraudsters are trying to get your information. Technology is a way that you can protect your information. You just have to, again, <laughs> your defense is a good offense, right? So learn technology and how you can protect yourself before the fraudster can come in and get your PII information. That's right. It's a tool just like anything else. So if you use it smartly, there's nothing wrong with it. Exactly. Great. We're going to launch our second poll. We want to hear from you guys. And we want to know in this poll, what do you think is the most common type of identity theft? So here we go. We're going to launch this poll and tell us what you think. We've got three options on there. Do you think that the most commonly reported type of identity theft is checking account identity theft, income tax identity theft, or medical insurance identity theft? Tell us what you think. I'm sure most of you didn't even realize, wow, I didn't know there could be different kinds of identity theft. Well, that's what we're gonna talk about next. All right, almost everyone has voted. This is great results. Keep them coming. Got a few more people left to vote. All right. All right, here we go. We're gonna share our results. Okay. A lot of people think that I check checking account identity theft. So what that is, is when a fraudster gets your PII that they open an account at a bank without your knowledge. And the example I gave earlier where they write bad checks or make payments and overdraw the account. And then it gets what we call in the banking center charged off, which can uh, affect you opening accounts elsewhere at any other financial institution, and it can essentially affect your credit at the same time. So let's see what is, is that the correct answer though? So here we go, we're going to the next slide. It's not on here, but it's on my notes. Actually, the most commonly reported type of um, identity theft is tax ID theft. How many, I'm like, again, <laughs> if I was in the class, I'd look at the show of hands but you know I'm sure a lot of you have heard about you know people going and filing their taxes and then they get there to the office and it's like what we show that you've already filed your taxes and I'm like well, what are you talking about no I didn't I'm here how did that happen well you know fraudsters are using your information to file all your taxes and get your hard-working money 
you know, the taxes that you overpaid and they're getting that money before you do, which is why now when you follow your taxes, um, a lot of um, tax companies will now um, ask you to enter even so um, the IRS, if you go through the IRS, they'll ask you if you want to set a pin and some even actually require it. So now every time you file your taxes, you have to file a or use a unique uh, pin identifier so that they know this was you and they send you an alert if somebody else attempted to or if they found out that somebody uh, else did your taxes before you. So like we talked about earlier, they're able to open your new accounts. You know, they could go to a completely different other bank, you know, First Convenience, Bank of America, Chase, a lot of these places that allow you to open accounts even online. Like I said, you don't even have to come in person to the bank anymore to open an account. So if they get your PII, it's as simple as them going onto the computer, logging onto a website, putting in all your personal information and creating a brand new account. I even had customers, and this is actually something new that they just started where a fraudster, now, yes, fraudsters are good at stealing your information, but I'll be honest, they're not always the brightest people. I have recently had a fraudster who opened an account at another bank and they stole a check from one of my customers here at our bank and they used the account information on the check to fund the new account that they opened at another branch, at another bank, uh, as an opening deposit. So more like, a, I'm sure a lot of you have heard what an ACH payment, which is a clearinghouse payment. So it's essentially an electronic check. Um, so they used it to fund it. Now, I'm glad to say that that person got caught because they, instead of using a whole new person's identity, they used their own ident identification to open the online account so they were caught. So these fraudsters, they aren't always the brightest. So, you know, most of them are just there to try and make a quick buck. So they can get a whole new ID and get a passport. You know, a lot of, I know if you go to the DMV and if you don't, you've lost your driver's license or ID card, all you need to provide is a social security card, like a high school diploma, um, I'm trying to remember what I did when I first got my ID, but you just need to provide all these different documents. And if they look good, they give you a new ID. So they don't even have to know, they don't need a picture ID to confirm who you are. They assume because you have all this personal information, your PII, right? That you have to be this person. So they can get a brand new ID with a picture, with their picture in your PII information. They can receive, and I'm, this, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know this until probably a few years ago that people use uh, uh, PII to get medical care, to use your insurance. They get a hold of your insurance card, have managed to get an ID or something in your name and get your personal information and they're getting medical care free of charge at your expense. You know, you end up paying deductibles or oh, you got a surgery. What surgery? What are you talking about? I'm in perfectly good health. How did I get this? How did I get that? They can even get employment. You think, why would somebody want to get a job in my name? Well, today there's plenty of jobs that run your credit. I know for to work at a bank, they run your credit to see if you qualify to work for a bank. And I know banks aren't the only ones. There are other businesses that will run your credit to see if maybe, I think for a bank, what they look at is, well, they want to make sure, well, you know, this person is going to guide other clients. They're going to teach and, and, and show others how to manage their finances. Well, we need to make sure that they're able to do that themselves, right? And if they don't have such good credit or if they have, you know, derogatory remarks or um, maybe they're wanted, maybe they're felons, obviously they wouldn't be able to get a job. So they need to steal your, your information to get that. And like we talked about, file income taxes. They steal your personal information and then they 
reap the rewards of your hard work. Oh, and I'll just give you this quick fact about the tax ID theft. It says tax or, tax or wage related identity theft is the most commonly reported type of identity theft accounting for 46%, 46% of reported incidents and then credit card fraud follows at 16%. So that means out of 100% of the incidences that are reported, you know, fraudulently identity theft, almost half of that, almost half is tax ID theft. It's crazy, right? All righty, here we go. So tips to protect your personal information. So there are a number of ways that you can protect yourself. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people know this. Shred your documents. Anything that you have that has your personal information, credit card statements, uh, receipts that might have your card number, these pre-approved credit card applications. A lot of people, oh no, I don't want a credit card, throw it away. But this has a lot of your personal, your PII information. So you need to dispose of this properly because you may not want it, but what's to stop a fraudster from digging in your trash, pulling that out and applying for that credit card themselves in your name. Bank statements right here. And one way that banks have offered an alternative to this so that you're not getting a bank statement in the mail. When you open your statement, it has everything. It has your routing number, your account number, your transactions. You know, it has information. A lot of people think, well, what can a fraudster do with my transaction history? Well, when you call the bank to get information about your account or to get a service or maintenance, a bank might use your transaction history as an additional identifier. That's what we call an, uh, an identifier is other ways we use to prove who you are. If you're calling us on the phone, we verify your name. You give us an account number. We verify that you're a signer on the account. We'll ask for maybe your social security number, your date of birth, your mother's maiden name. Second identifiers are transaction history. When did you open your account? Do you have other signers on that account? And all that information is on your bank statement. So if they already have what we call primary identifiers, which would be your PII information, correct? And then they have second identifiers. They could call your bank. If they have your bank statement included and your PII information, they could call your bank and change an address, change a phone number, change, you know, or request a transfer or something like that with just that information so that they start receiving things at the new address or if the bank is calling them calling the client to verify a check they'll call the fraudster instead of the actual customer you know things like that insurance statements insurance statements have a lot of PII information as well I talked about this client who had her uh, her bill stolen that she was mailing out treat it just like a trash Instead of putting it in your mailbox, go to the post office. If you feel more secure and mailing your payments, that's fine. You can do that. But, and I actually told my customer this, I said, next time, if you want to continue doing that, that's your choice, but put it directly in the post office. You know, their boxes are going to be a lot more secure. I would even go to the step to physically hand it to a post officer, you know, a postman or a post woman. Uh, make sure you're removing your mail. This is kind of hard because we don't always know when our mail is going to get dropped off. Me personally, I have uh, a lock on my mailbox. So, you know, I work throughout the day and I know my mailman probably gets there pretty early uh, in the morning and I'm already gone for the day. So I know, you know, I have a key to unlock my mailbox. So when I get my mail, you know, I have to unlock it to get it. So I know it's harder for them to get my bills or anything that I might have in there. And this is another thing. How do we get our debit cards? They come in the mail. How do you get a credit card that you'd approve for? They come in the mail. You know, so that's, we have to think about those things. A lot of times we don't realize like, oh, wow, you know, my mail is, I need to 
secure it better because you do get very sensitive information in there. And like I mentioned, switch to sensitive information where they'll put less information on the statement itself. They won't have as much personal, as much uh, PII. And then electronic versions. I mentioned that earlier, having electronic statements. Secure your information for your laptop. All your, you know, if you use your mobile app on your phone for your banking, um, these day and age with these smartphones, your phone is your computer. So not just your laptop at home, but I mentioned that family member, that black sheep, roommates. You know, if you have um, a cleaning lady that comes in or somebody who comes and cares for your kids, you know, we, as much as we love our family and friends, you can't 100% know what somebody is going through. I can't tell you how many times I've had a client come in my office and say, I have no clue how this happened and come to find out that it was a family member or a close friend or somebody that they employed. You know, like I said, as much as we want to think that everybody is good out there, unfortunately, that is not always the case. Okay. Additional ways. So we talked about uh, your computers, your laptops, not just having passwords, but having antivirus software. Because what did we mention earlier? The phishing schemes, right? You get this email from Bath and Body Works for a $50 gift card. You click it and all of a sudden, you know, whoever sent you that email automatically has access to your computer and can, if you access your bank account on your computer, there you go. They've just gotten your password. They've gotten your user ID. They've gotten anything they need to access your account online. So finding a good antivirus software with firewalls, you know, to protect you from sites that you might visit, emails that you might open accidentally, or phishing scheme, you know, those phishing emails that you might get. And then make sure that your operating system is up to date. Your operating system is, you know, the Windows, uh, Google, those are the things that you're using to actually search your site, like your um, your web browser. Uh, Windows is, is a big um, operating system, so that's the most common we use. Make sure it's always up to date. Facebook. I know Facebook is probably for us older generations, you know, the kids these days are like, what's Facebook? We don't do that. That's it's Instagram and uh, Snapchat and whatever those other ones are. I know I don't look that old, but I, I'm up there. <laughs> so um, Facebook, you know, how many times have you gone on Facebook and all of a sudden you see an ad for this sofa that you were looking at or this website that you were shopping and you're like, wow, what are the odds of that? what's well, not the odds is all these apps and everything are connected, right? You know, if we use like, let's say a, a Google account, your Gmail, right? You use Google as your browser and you obviously have it on your phone. And then when you download the app, you know, the huge long disclosure that they give you. And we just like, oh yeah, I just want the app. Just click yes. Okay, let's go. Well, in those, disclosures, it's, you're essentially giving them access to be able to, um, you'll see, oh, can we have control of your camera? Can we track your location? Can we, all those things. And if you link one account to another account to another account, well, all that information just transfers over, right? So they're able to access everything. They know what you're looking at, when you're looking at, where you're at when you're looking at it. I'm like, it can be scary. But there's ways for you to protect yourself from that. You know, on Facebook, you can put on there, no, I'm, I don't want to share this information. It's all in your settings. Read the disclosures. I know they can be really long, but um, again, don't just click any random ad that pops on your screen. You know, you want to make sure it's legitimate. If it's not, or if you don't know, if you question it in any way, you know what, it's not even worth the risk. Go to the site itself. I know Bath and Body Works is always has a sale, so I just go to the, to the site. I don't worry about what I'm getting in my emails or what pops up on Facebook. And then right here, password lock. 
nowadays, you know, I know iPhone has a face ID, you just, you know, it uses your face, you know, the biometrics, you know, you can use your fingerprint uh, or your thumbprint on the front or in the back or wherever you may have it on your phone or, or some people just use the traditional password, but it's important to have those passwords and not to disclose those passwords to people. You know, like I said, you never know somebody 100%. Sorry, it skipped a slide there. Here we go. Other tips. Sign your cards. I'm sure everybody there is like, sign your card? What do you mean sign your card? Where do you sign your card? I can't tell you how many cards I've gotten from clients that come in and it's not signed on the back. You know, you're like, well, what is that good does that do? Well, when you go to a merchant, that's something that most or merchants should be doing is if you have to sign an actual a uh, card receipt, you know, they, they should be matching your signature to what you're signing. And if it doesn't match, you're gonna be like, well, something's not right here. So that's the way that they can sign it. And make sure you're shredding the old cards. You know, your card is maybe expired, but that doesn't mean that a roster can't use that card to get um, your new card information. Because a lot of times what's going on is, a bank is issuing you a new card, but it's the same card number, and we just changed the expiration date and the security code on the back. So right off the bat, if a fraudster gets your old card, they automatically have your new card number. They just need to figure out your expiration date and the code on the back. Uh, carry your card separately. Uh, I know this might be hard for, you know, the ladies in the audience, right? We all have our purses with everything in there, right? Your wallet's in there, everything is together. But I started doing this. I don't even carry a wallet any, or a purse anymore. I have my little business card holder. Let me see if I can find it so I can show you. Here we go. I have this little business card holder where not only do I keep business cards in there, but I have, I keep my ID and maybe my most used debit card and that's it. Minimize how many cards you carry. I know we're in the habit of carrying everything and, oh, well, I don't know what card I'm going to use. Before you go out shopping for the day, be like, okay, this is what I have. Do I want to use my bank account? Do I want to use my credit card? Pick one or two cards and only have that. So that way, if your purse gets stolen or your wallet gets stolen, they only have access to maybe those one or two and it's easier to call one or two banks versus if you have five or six different different cards, right? Keep a record of your account numbers, cards, expiration dates, phone numbers, addresses in a secure place. I know a lot of us, like I said, our phones are our computers now, right? So we keep our passwords there. Just make sure that you are securing it. And then right here, only give out your credit card and other sensitive information on calls that you make. So if somebody is calling you and requesting sensitive information, that already should be a red flag. A bank will never call you and ask you for personal information. All right. So if you do believe that you're um, a victim of fraud, here are the three credit bureaus uh, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, here are the websites, phone numbers. The second you find out that you are a victim of identity theft or suspect that you are, call these people. Lock your, um, notify your creditor, uh, notify your bank. A lot of banks, I actually had a customer recently who he fell to a phishing scheme. He clicked an email. He really thought it was legitimate. And when he got through it, he said, you know what? This is not right. We had to close all his old accounts and open all new ones and transfer everything over. And it was just not worth the risk to keep them open. Contact Social Security. You want to make sure that your Social Security number is protected. They can, if your social security card is stolen, they'll send you a new one and they can kind of put um, 
advise you on what to do next on uh, how to monitor your social and make sure that things are are okay and no fraud has been attempted using your social. And then, like I said, call any one or all three of them. I'd call all three of them of the credit bureaus just to make sure with all these credit bureaus, how many, okay, <laughs> I keep referring back to as if I was in the classroom, is how many people knew that you could log your social security number? Did anybody know that? You know, that should have been a poll question I should have asked, but you can lock your social security number. In fact, I have my social security number locked with all three credit bureaus. And for some of them, it's as easy as going on the website and just click. Oh, I didn't mean to actually click. <laughs> just click and your social is locked. So anybody who attempts to open a credit card or open an account or anything using your social, it will automatically send a message. I don't know if anybody's locked their credit in the past and you applied for a credit card or something or a car loan and they told you, hey, your social security is locked. We can't do anything. You can just call them, go to the website, research it. Hey, how can I lock my, my card? Or not my card, but my social. Uh, your bank services, your bank offers a lot of ways to help you prevent identity theft. Some, some banks have an actual identity theft program. So you can sign up for a lot of these are pretty, they have basic services for just, I'm like less than $10 a month. I know when we carry the product, unfortunately we don't carry it anymore. The cheapest was about $6.95 a month and it can go up from, from there and it's just you know, the level of protection. It could be basic where you can monitor it all the way up to where the bank will monitor it for you. Get account alerts, you know, I know everybody has the app, you know, don't just get, get alerts of when your balance, what your balance is every day. You should know if you're balancing your account frequently, hey, that's not right. I should have more than that. You know, get an alert when a large transaction comes out. Wait, that wasn't me. Let me see what's going on using web banking, mobile banking, electronic statements we talked about. Um, you can do mobile deposits on a lot of uh, bank apps now and do electronic transfers instead of writing somebody a check or even paying your bills electronically as well. All righty. And like we said before, the best offense is a good defense. Stay informed. You know, we have a fraud center ourselves, and I know a lot of banks do now. Um, you can learn about the latest fraud scams, um, how to report fraud, and that's actually on the PDF I showed earlier, which I'll bring back up here at the end if you want to copy some information. Um, that's this how our fraudster is still in your identity. Like I said, monitor your accounts, your banking activities, get alerts, and then immediately report unauthorized transactions. Once you get that alert saying, well, you bought, you went to Gucci and purchased a person, but uh, I can't afford Gucci. I know that wasn't me. Call your bank right away. I know some uh, banks allow you through the app to start a, uh, a claim in the app itself. And that's it. Sorry, I kind of rushed a little bit through those other, the last few. It's just I know we're running a little over, so I'm going to toggle back over. Here is the PDF I was talking to you guys about, how our fraudsters are stealing your identity. And this is just a big overview of everything we went over. So like I said, Blaine, I'll send this to you so you're able to provide it to anybody who's needing it or maybe put it up on your site or however you're able to get that over. Um, this is just a big overview. It's got numbers. Um, websites, everything we talked about in a nutshell, essentially. But that's it. I think we're ready for questions, if we're going to have to take questions. Yeah, that was very happy. Louisa, we've got some good questions that have come in. Um, so first of all, I did just share Louisa's contact information in the chat, um, if you're interested in reaching out to her personally after today's presentation. Um, for anything, including any questions you might have about this subject. Um, and like Louisa mentioned, she will share this PDF 
um, with myself and our team, Porfirio and Aretha, who are on here behind the scenes today. Um, so if you're working with one of our counselors and if you'd like to get this PDF, just reach out and we'll send it to you next week. Um, Louise, one of the questions that came through during the presentation that I wanted to pitch to you was, can people steal your identity with a wiring account number? Is that possible? Wiring account number. Um, normally, if you do a wire transfer, you have to use your actual account number and a routing or SWIFT code, depending if it's domestic or international. So if you're giving the actual account number, I know there's some that will direct it to like a middle account and then transfer it to the actual account later. But if it's your actual account number, anytime you're providing your actual routing number and account number, your information is at risk. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, I mean, there's so many different ways. You did a phenomenal job today, Lisa, kind of running through a lot of the co most common ways and that you can get your identity stolen. Um, and, you know, it's way more popular than people think it is. I know we saw a couple of comments come through about people saying, this is really scary. I mean, this is really popular. And it yeah. is. And I promise my intent wasn't to scare you guys. You know, I, it's, <laughs> right. I want you guys to be aware of just, and that's the thing, a lot of people, I have somebody sitting across from me and they come in and they're just completely blindsided. They're like, I didn't even know this existed. I didn't even know this could happen. You know, and that's why I'm glad that Blaine reached out to us and said, hey, can you guys do this? Because I'm like, wow, this is going to be awesome. You know, this is going to be able to reach so many people and inform so many people. So I don't want to scare you. <laughs> this, the whole point was to, uh, you know, bring awareness and show you how you can protect yourself against all these ways of fraudsters trying to get your information. That's right, because you just don't know. You know, information is power. It's, um, you know, for me personally, a very timely, um, you know, a timely uh, point to have this discussion. Just a few days ago, I was visiting <clears throat> some family and an elderly family member um, of ours was sharing about, you know, how their spouse, who also is, you know, an elderly family member, um, was on the phone giving all sorts of personal information out to a scammer. You know, and so this kind of stuff happens all the time. And um, it's not it's nice. personal, it's just about you've got to be prepared to not to stop. You know, we said earlier, how often do you get these scam calls on your phone? I think Teresa said daily, me too, Teresa. And it is okay, over. I'm, I'm blocking numbers every single day. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, like Louisa said over and over, best offense is defense. You know, the other thing I will say right now, in, again, in the age of COVID-19, this is really more important than ever. Early on, like if you attended our very first webinar that we did back in April on financial fitness during COVID-19, we talked about at that point the stimulus checks, which were brand new, right? And there was so much fraud that was taking place with stimulus checks. Why? Because those were issued through the IRS. And like Louisa mentioned, that is the number one source of identity theft is tax fraud. And so... If you didn't know that your identity has been stolen in the last tax year, you know, it, there was a very big chance that someone else ended up with your money. That should mm -hmm. have come. Um, and, I, and I know one of our, actually two of our participants today have said that they personally have been victims of identity theft, which we hate to hear. And, you know, again, you know, what one of our um, participants said specifically she was a victim of and tax identity theft, and that now, you know, every year when she goes to file her taxes, she's got to use a PIN to do that. It's one of these things, I mean, you basically live with that just about forever, because mm -hmm. that's how long your information will live on. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize this, it's quick for these guys to steal your stuff and run up all these charges and get all this credit, and you're in the hole, mm -hmm. and it takes years, I mean, years to recover from identity theft. Yeah, because you know, your information lives in this black market, you mm -hmm. know, it's out there. And a lot of times your information is sold and resold and resold. And so that's what makes it difficult is that you might think, well, it's been five years, maybe I'm okay, maybe, or maybe and, not. And, and I'm gonna get rid of the stereotype right now. Don't think that this only happens to people with 750, 800 credit scores and have millions of dollars to spend no, I have 
the everyday Joe sitting right across from me and they have decent credit. They only make maybe 40,000 a year, you know, and their identities are getting stolen. You know, they're not, it doesn't happen to the rich and famous as, as often people might think, oh, those are the people you're gonna target. No, because these people have ways to protect their information. You know, they go after the people who don't have the, those type of defenses to protect their information or that are just aren't knowledgeable about it. We've got a couple of questions coming in. I love to see that. Um, well, first, I want to start with our first question that came through just before you ended, Luisa. We had a question about uh, from one of our participants asking if you could um, recap again how you can go about freezing your social security number. Okay, so you can just go to the websites uh, for Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. You can go directly on these sites. And I didn't monitor it. Like, I know I told you, Blaine, I kind of just go with the flow, so I don't always look at my notes. I wanted to talk about using uh, different ways to monitor your credit, like Credit Karma. It's really, it's free. And you guys don't always have to pay for this type of service. If you have a credit card, I know Capital One, Bank of America, even Comerica offers on the credit card itself, you know, updates on your report and things like that. But even these sites here, Equifax, Experian, and Transfusion, you can log in and create just a basic account where it doesn't cost you anything, but you can still monitor your account. And I know TransUnion for a fact uh, literally has a lock your social button on there and you just click it and it's locked. I, I want to say I did have to call myself for Equifax and Experian uh, and you can do it over the phone and lock mm -hmm. it over the phone and it'll ask you that'll be one of the prompts do you want to lock your social and it'll walk you through how to do that and they'll mm -hmm. send you an email notification a text i got an email and a text and they'll even send you something in the mail uh sh saying that your stuff was locked mm -hmm. but yeah. you also have to remember if you do that if you're wanting to purchase a house or a car or apply for a credit card talk to the lender and say hey who do you run because my credit is locked i'll have to unlock it and then you can go right back and lock it so that's a perfect segue into our next question, Louisa. We actually got this very question um, from Teresa who asked, if we freeze our credit during an application of buying a home, will it affect the home buying process? So like Louisa just mentioned, you know, um, it, it's not that it negatively affects the home buying process so much as knowing that when you're obtaining a, a home loan, a mortgage, your credit will be run at multiple points by your lender. And so it's really important if you have frozen your social security number. Um, or your credit, or if you intend to do so before you close on a home, make sure that you disclose that to your lender if you're already working with a lender. And that is inclusive of if you're working with a housing counselor, if you're working with Sergio or Rita in our program. We do run credit as well, as you likely already know if you're working with us. Um, although in counseling, we run what's called a soft pull. It doesn't affect your credit score, but it is still affected um, if you have a freeze on your credit, we're not able to pull it. So you just need to let us know in advance. And then what you'll often need to do is call the bureau or bureaus that you have it frozen with to release that and authorize the entity that's looking to pull your credit um, the ability to do so. Um, Louisa, our last question I think that has come in is um, we have an individual, um, a participant today who said that they were also a victim of identity theft with uh, tax, identity theft specifically. And somebody else um, that they do not know claimed their daughter as a dependent on their tax return. What do they need to do for their next tax return that they're going to file next year? Um, I would honestly, I'm going to direct that question to your tax professional. Um, they will tell you and be able to give you specifics on what steps to take. Um, it depends on what you've done so far. Were you able to submit a claim on, you know, the previous year and is it cleared up? Are we still working on the process? It just kind of really varies on where you're at. And to be honest, your tax professionals are going to be most current on what's going on with your tax identity theft. So I, I really recommend go, going to your tax professional and even go to the IRS website. IRS.gov has a lot of very useful information. 
That's right. Yeah. And I think that the most important thing that you can do to, you know, our conversation today to all of our participants out there is make sure that you take swift action. If you know that you were a victim of identity theft, don't sit on that information without taking action. Right. So in that example, you know, if your daughter was claimed on someone else's tax return, that's not that's not something necessarily credit related yet. OK, at this point, although it does indicate they have your daughter's social security number. OK, so it could be um, at a later point. But as it stands today, right, um, we know that they have at least that piece of information and they've chose to utilize it in one way so far. So at minimum, um, I and this is a this is, you know, Lane slash Habitat professional opinion, but we would say um, consider filing a police report on that to have formal documentation that you were a victim of identity theft because, um, you know, that information can be very hard to fight if it gets out of control and develops into other types of identity theft down the line if you don't have your documentation in queue. Exactly. And when you start trying to correct everything if you've been a victim of identity theft that's going to be the first thing they require is for you to file a police report and going back to uh, the person who had their daughter got claimed you guys it's not just your information that can be stolen your kids information is at risk as well you know yeah they're young and they're not applying for anything but they have social security numbers I can't tell you how many times I've had customers come up how did my kid has a credit card? How do they have credit already? What's going on? They didn't do this. They were 10 years old or anybody who has a social security number, any kind of personal identifying information can get their identity stolen. So don't just protect your information, protect your kids information, educate your children. You know, I, I know I came from a generation, I came from a family that my father had no clue about any of this you know I used to have to help him you know with this checking account you know it's just wasn't a big thing generations and generations ago but it's becoming more open and more frequent and now it's more public and we're talking about it and it's okay to talk about it and you know our job now is once you're educated educate your kids show them how to manage their account show them how to manage their credit and I can't tell many people I get walking in the door and you know, they don't share that information with their children because they don't know it themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go to your banker. Your banker should be able to answer your questions, should be able to help you walk you through this. And if you go to a banker and they can't answer those questions, then that's what I'm going to tell you. Call me. Then maybe I need to be your banker <laughs> because if your bank or your banker's not doing that, that might not be the bank for you. And I, I assure you, I have this conversation with all of my clients. Yeah, because like, you know, to your point, we said, you know, banking, much like we would say at, at Dallas Habitat, like housing counseling, in any time of, you know, financial advising situation, that is about trust and rapport and relationship building. So it is critical. Make sure that the individual that you're trying to advise you on these kinds of situations is someone that you personally and can trust. I, I would share too to Louise's point, don't forget if you're familiar with Dallas Habitat and our program offerings, one of the fantastic resources that we offer is called PocketWise. PocketWise is our online free, um, super simple self-guided financial education on all different topics. And one of those topics is on prevention of identity theft. To Louise's point about educating your kids, PocketWise is a really good um, simple platform that older children are, are likely to be able to use well as well. Talking about like middle school, high school age, right? So if you've got kids in that age range that you're thinking, you know, my kids need some information on basic stuff. To Louisa's point, you may not know, you know, what they might be doing with your information. You just don't know. Right? All of us have been teenagers. We can think back on the kind of stuff that we did as teenagers. You know, we do some silly stuff in that age. Um, so, you know, making sure that you educate your kids so that they also understand and aren't, you know, taken advantage of when they hit 18 and they are receiving all of these, you know, credit card mm -hmm. offers and everything like that as well. So, you know, education is power. Yes. I, I will say, 
on behalf of Dallas Habitat, Louisa, on behalf of um, all of our attendees here today, um, my staff, Porphyr and Aretha, we want to thank you for this super important information now more than ever. And um, your presentation was fantastic. We look forward to getting this PDF and sharing that. Uh, like I mentioned, if you missed it in the chat, we have Louisa's contact information, or you can always reach out to our team and we are more than happy to share. To our participants, we want to thank you for joining in today and for taking time out of your Saturday to, to learn and be educated. And our next webinar will be in two weeks from today on uh, Saturday, the 25th of July, also at 10 a.m. And we are uh, talking with our partners at Bank of America about considering home ownership. And so you definitely don't want to miss that one. We hope to see you guys there. Louisa, again, thank you so much for everything that you've done today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure working with you. All right, you all have a fantastic weekend and we will see everyone here today in two weeks.